All right, can everybody hear me? All right. Well, welcome everybody. Is everybody enjoying Mix so far? Yeah? That, that was pretty weak. Come on, let's hear it. Who's enjoying Mix? Uh, all right, it's a little bit better. <laughs> um, so uh, hopefully everybody's grabbed a snack and had a chance to uh, take a quick break from the last session and everything. I, I was completely immersed in the HTML, CSS stuff that Thomas Lewis was talking about a session ago, um, or maybe two sessions ago, I guess. Um, so what I'm talking about today is cross-channel experience, the cross-channel experience. Um, and I'm going to get into what that means. But first, um, just real quick, um, just give you kind of a, a background. Um, there we go. Um, my name is Nick Fink. Um, I am a user experience evangelist at Blink. And basically what I do is marketing, PR, and training for uh, different clients. Um, so in-house training. Um, we do user experience design and research. Um, so we, we bring people into our labs and we go out into the field and we watch them use products and services. Um, and then we help them improve those things um, through you know, information architecture, interaction design, um, and uh, mock-ups and prototypes. Um, you can find me on Twitter, Nick F. Um, that's a uh, pretty active stream, so if you're kind of used to low volumes, that might be, might be quite a bit um, to take on. But um, I talk a lot about anything related to user experience, so definitely check that out if you're interested in that. Um, I do have a phobia of non-geek people. How many non-geek people in the room? All right. Jeff, you're going to have to move to the back. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so uh, going, going both ways, geek, non-geek, that's cool. Um, so I'm kind of give you a, a quick um, getting used to this controller. It's actually backwards, which is kind of interesting. Um, a quick overview. Uh, so we're going to talk about a few definitions related to what this crazy term is that I'm talking about. Um, and we're going to go into some methods and tools of um, how to make a great cross-channel experience. And then I'll have uh, examples, a few examples. Um, hopefully, you'll be able to get through all of them. Um, I've kind of planned it so that I have extra. Um, so we might have to cut that off early. And then we'll go into Q&A. Um, but just because Q&A is at the end um, doesn't mean you can't ask a question in the middle of the talk, um, provided that it's pretty related to what we're talking about and that it's kind of short and sweet. Um, so, and the other thing I want to mention is um, you might see me grab some Kleenex because um, I do have the sniffles, if you haven't noticed. Um, I'm coming, uh, uh, recovering from being sick last week. Um, so, an important number that we all need to know um, for this talk, if, the, if you take away from this talk one thing, um, it should be this number, 90%. What does 90% mean? 90% means 90% of businesses feel that cross-channel experience design is critical to the success of their business. Critical. Not just something that um, is nice to have, something that um, is going to help you improve the experience and you might get a few more customers. It's critical, mission critical to what they do. Now, we hear a lot about businesses succeeding that have invested in user experience or experience design or something like that. Um, we see Microsoft investing a lot in experience design. Um, and you see the successful results from that. Um, look at Windows Mobile 7. Look at Connect. Um, good examples of where things can go um, if you invest in experience design. Now, um, so what is cross-channel experience design? Um, well, when we're talking about it from the design standpoint of the actual building and producing um, of uh, cross-channel experience, um, it's basically the process of designing for the touch points, all the touch points across the organization, regardless of what channel they may fall into. So when I say channel, I mean things like web, mobile, um, retail, packaging, product. Um, and that, that means like product engineering, physical devices. Um, it also can mean things like social media, uh, broadcast television, radio, uh, print advertising, mailers, newsletters, um, covers the whole gamut. So I know what you're thinking. Wait, 
you know, isn't this guy just talking about user experience design? Because when we think about user experience design, the roots of user experience design comes from uh, the concept that a user could be a user of anything, somebody who uses something. So that could mean uh, somebody who uses this water bottle, somebody who uses a piece of software, somebody who reads a book is a user of that book, somebody who goes into a retail space is a user of that retail space. True. That's where user experience design was first uh, uh, conceived. That's, that's the base idea of it. But it evolved into being kind of something more related to uh, screen design, digital screen design, and sometimes products, sometimes the actual physical products themselves, um, but mostly in digital screen. Um, what about customer experience design? The marketers um, have bu built this kind of entire space of, of uh, a discipline uh, related to customer experience design. It's been around for a very long time. And essentially, it's the same kind of thing. Service design. So people that invest in uh, service-based industries, like the airline industry is a service, for example, um, or products, even, um, when you're making a physical device. It's all related and connected to service design in some way. So aren't I just talking about all three of these things? The answer is yes. It is all three of these things. Cross-channel experience is related to all of these aspects and more. And I'll get into specifics here. So why do we care? What, what, what does it matter that we're doing cross-channel experience design or not? Well, when you look at the numbers, 70% of online customers research a product online and purchase them offline. 70%. That is a huge number. If you're in an online retail space, you can't afford to think about the, uh, especially if, you, well, specifically if you are in an online retail space um, and you also have a physical brick and mortar, mortar store, um, then you can't afford to ignore the cross-channel experience and that kind of dynamic of what happens when somebody does the research online and then comes to your store. 65% of search visitors who are looking to, uh, for further are looking for further information um, from something they saw in another channel, specifically usually broadcast. So like they saw a telev television commercial, they searched, they did a Bing search or something like that, and then they came to your website. Um, they're looking for more information about what they just saw. So does your website answer that call? 53% of mobile searches on Bing have local intent. 53% of people that are searching on Bing on mobile are looking for something locally connected to them. So a restaurant, a cafe, some place to get their hair cut, you know, something local. So that's going from brick and mortar, or from digital to brick and mortar. So I'm gonna talk about three touch points, uh, three types of touch points. Um, touch points are a kind of interesting thing, um, and I'll get into specifics, but they're not channels. They're not, you know, mobile is not a touch point in itself. A touch point is the experience that somebody has with mobile, right? Um, so there are three types. One's static. So this is packaging design or, um, you know, mailers or, or ads in magazines. It's physical products, physical device, you know, the plastic and rubber and metal that make up a physical product. Interactive touch points, things that have um, a two-way engagement, something that you can reply or respond to, something that gives you a response back, whether it's an, from another human or from a system or something else. So websites, social media, right? Twitter, Facebook, whatever. Um, and uh, software, apps, OSs. Third thing is human touch points. When you think about a business, it's about people, right? People are interfacing with other people, somehow. They go to the store, they talk to a salesperson, talk to an expert on a subject matter expert there. Uh, they um, call up tech support. They're talking to somebody there. Um, they might have to go through a system to get to them, but that is a human touch point. Um, and, uh, you know, everything down to um, maybe even people here that are presenting at Mix um, from a company uh, like Microsoft or something, um, that's a human touch point. So 
you might think of your work as being so something being done in the confines of a channel. So I work on the mobile team. I work on the desktop team. I work on the search team. I work on search for mobile or whatever it might be, right? Um, but it's actually more than that um, because the customer doesn't think about that. They don't think, oh, well, this was designed by this marketing group over here or this group of you know, user experience designers and this over here was designed by a different group. So it makes sense that they're, they look different, they act different, have a different kind of um, you know, branding, and it's fine to have sub-brands and all that, but um, it's, to the customer, it's really, they're working with one business. They see that whole thing uh, as one kind of connected entity that they assume that everybody is talking to each other and working together. So how do we craft a good cross-channel user experience, a cross-channel experience? What is, what is it that we need to, to make this consistent across the board? Is this something that can be done by a few people or one person? Is this something that takes an army to do or an entire company? Well, let's start talking about methods. So how we do it in a, in a sort of process sort of way. First thing we do, much like user experience design, so we observe the user. We observe people using the product, using the software, going to the retail store, calling up tech support. We see that experience firsthand. We take lots of notes. We videotape it. We audio record it. We watch that entire experience all the way through. And in that case, we want to pay attention to the context of use. What, what's the space like that they're operating in? How are they going and using this? Is it that maybe they're using a product that doesn't have a mobile website, but they're using it through their mobile device as a, you know, through the browser? Or is there a special app designed for that particular context? Is it something that they're doing on the run, or are they sitting down at a desk? Are they in the office? Are they jumping from conference room to conference room when they use this product or service? These are all things that need to be kind of considered when um, when we're looking at this, um, when we're looking at the cross-channel experience. Because it doesn't just end with one platform or one device. You might, your project might be related to um, you know, a software app for mobile or a game for Xbox or something like that. But it doesn't just end with that because that experience travels way before that, it goes back to retail when the per person purchased that software, whether it was online or in the store, all the way through the final experience um, and customer support, tech support, and whatever it might be on the other end. Attention to detail. <laughs> what's going on? Like, what's happening? What, what just happened there? You know, you see an experience, and all of a sudden, something um, unanticipated occurs. Understanding why that occurred and looking at the, the behavior and responses to that, how people react to when that event occurs. And not just events, but What's influence them, influencing them um, in the way they behave when they're using your product or service? Um, you know, maybe even what kind of wine are they drinking at the time they're using your product, right? <laughs> so look for hacks. Look, look for uh, ways that people are circumventing a, a, you know, out of the box sort of experience and building their own experience around it so that it's easier to use. This is actually the Blink coffee maker. Um, so in my company, this is sitting in our, our uh, lunch room, or lunch space, kitchen. Um, and you can see here, there's many different things that have, that have happened to it. The, the poor device has, has been customized. Um, because we felt that what it came with out of the box wasn't sufficient enough to tell us what we needed to know. We built our own nomenclature around the dials. We built our own instructions about how to care and clean from the machine because the machine doesn't tell us. It just blinks that there's an error. Then we have to go to the manual off the right-hand side to interpret what that error really means. It looks like a coffee cup that's broken in half. What does that mean? So a bad experience, right? How do we fix that? How do we, you know, and this is not something that we would necessarily observe or know um, if we were just testing the interface itself. We need to see that experience in the wild. We need to see how people are actually using the product and where they place it, what they do to it. And follow that experience all the way through. So I talked about it being more than just the part of the project you're working on. It happens before and after that, right? So um, if you're 
you know, working on, say, something like Netflix. You know, follow all the way through the entire customer engagement. Where's the final touch point that they have with that business before completing the cycle again for a second time? You know, and then what happens after that? What happens after they drop it into the mail? Because it's like black magic, right? You drop your Netflix into the mail and it just, something happens, right? So see how the business operates. See how their processes are internally. So we talked about researching customers and users and people that are interfacing with systems and things. But we also need to look at the business and how they also play a part. The customer might not be exposed to that, but it doesn't mean it's not part of the cross-channel experience. Because right here, your system, your business systems and processes, um, how you deliver the goods, the logistics behind the scenes, how people are managed, how groups are organized, how physical space is, is set up for teams. All that is related to cross-channel experience. So we also need to understand how the employees work, not just how the processes and systems are put in place, but how the actual employees work. What do they do? How is their you know, uh, workstation configured? Um, have they modified stuff from the standard kind of uh, you know, implementation of how the workstation should be? Is it more efficient with that modification? Is it less efficient? Why did they do that? How can they work different than the standard pattern that has been previously defined? Doing interviews with internal folks that are working on some aspect of the, of the project um, or product um, is, is pretty critical, finding out that information. So don't just you know, interview the users and customers. Don't just interview the stakeholders and get the business requirements. Don't just interview the technology people to find out what the system and technical requirements are. Interview the actual people behind the scenes, the employees that are interfacing with the different individuals and customers. So let's talk about tools. There's a metaphor that goes behind most tools that I've seen when we're dealing with cross-channel experience. And that metaphor has a series of components to it. Um, let's call it the rock concert. We have the audience, right? We have the people that are observing the experience, right? Um, and when we think about that, that's essentially the customer or the user, okay? Um, in social media, it could be many people at the same time. In a software environment, it could still be many people or it could just be one person. So it's the audience is one component of it. The other component is the on-stage experience. So here I'm sitting on stage, I'm the public kind of face of this presentation, right? Um, just like in the case of a product or service, um, you know, there's the on-stage presence of, you know, who is at the retail store that's actually right there in front of the customer, or who is on the other side of the phone call that they're having with technical support. That's the on-stage person at that time. The product itself, the packaging, the design of the physical device and the interface itself, that's on stage. It's all fully exposed to the customer. Then there's this area that, that is not exposed, this, this area that the customer never really sees. It's, it's the behind the curtain. It's where Oz works, right? The Wizard of, of Oz, right? It's the backstage, right? It's all this moving parts. And it might involve systems and people and processes, but there's all these things that happen behind the scenes. This is, again, part of this metaphor of the cross-channel experience. And we have support systems, which usually operate behind the scenes. Sometimes we have customers that directly interface with them through websites and software. But for the most part, they're the systems, the architecture, the network infrastructure, the PBX that runs the phone systems, all that stuff. That support systems in the back end that the customer isn't necessarily directly exposed to. They might see, you know, hear a command on the phone that says, press five to get to technical support or something like that. But that experience is the onstage experience. There's this whole backstage experience that's happening with all these systems and processes on the back end to make that message come up and to deliver them to where they need to go. So those are the metaphors for tools, right? The tools themselves are pretty straightforward based on that metaphor. Customer journey map. So after you've like observed this whole experience end to end, you've gone through and watched customers go from sitting at home doing research online to going into the retail store to buying the product to talking to the salesperson to walking home to unpackaging that product to setting it up um, and 
By the way, we're also going to have a session after this talking about the unpackaging experience. If you want to see how that's done, definitely stay around. Um, and then from there, um, we, we have all these interfaces, these things that are done, these actions that are taken from the customer's end or from the business end um, that cross that, that channel of, of, from between the audience and the on-stage presence. And then there's the back-end systems, of course, at the bottom there. Um, uh, you know, the behind the scenes, backstage. People that you don't interface with on a regular basis. Um, people that um, are not exposed to the customer, but play a critical role, like the editors, the managers, the, um, you know, dev team, whatever it might be. Um, so a customer journey map is essentially just mapping out that flow from end to end of that entire experience and what are all those touch points. What, you know, each touch point should be represented here. And I think there's a series of icons you can kind of see along the middle there um, that kind of represent that. So a customer journey map. There's also like a variation of that called the customer uh, or the experience map. Um, an experience map is kind of more of a stages. Um, sort of thing. It's more of a staged approach. What are the levels of engagement? So if you talk to like a sales or marketing person, they're going to say like the sales funnel, right? There's the people that aren't aware of us, the people that are sort of aware of us and are doing research, and then people that have purchased from us, and people that keep repeating, doing repeat purchases, and then there's the advocates and evangelists. Um, so this is kind of going through that process step by step based on how this particular business, in this case Comcast, for a game system um, and, and what it's like to go through that step by step. Here's one that I did for, for Blink internally. Um, and it's just uh, basically just the experience for social media, just with Twitter. This is just Twitter. Um, you could go into way more detail than you need to. You could go really high level when you're creating a service blueprint. Service Blueprint represents the entire service from end to end. These are all documents and formats and stuff that are available publicly online um, on a number of sites. Um, one is, I believe, servicedesigntools.org or something like that. Um, it's a pretty good one. Um, but basically, we're just mapping out kind of those touch points again. And you can see really clearly here, you have a physical evidence, the user actions, then there's a line of interaction. So this is between the business and the customer. And then we have the on-stage contact person, the public-facing side of things. Then there's a line of visibility. And this is where we talk about the curtain to the backstage, right? Um, and then we have the backstage contact person, the person behind the scenes. And then down at the bottom, we have um, a line of internal interaction with different systems. And down at the very, very bottom, those blue boxes are all systems and processes, um, servers and technology. So let's look at the business aspects of it, right? We talked a lot about, OK, here's the methods, here's the tools. But what about the business? How does this happen inside of a business? You know, we all like to think that our bosses are maybe Michael Scott, right? We can't be so fortunate, can we, right? <laughs> but, you know, that's not the case. You know, it, our, our bosses are more like Dave Wallace, right? Somebody we need to kind of convince. We need to show them the proof. We need to show them that, hey, you know, this is what happens when a good cross-channel experience is invested in. And there's a lot of things that are involved with that. It's not just one person going and doing this. This is not the work of one person. This is the work of an entire army or perhaps an entire company. So what we need to do is we actually need to break down the silos. We need to basically expand that communication to other departments and other groups, right? We need to be able to communicate the problems that we're having in the software space that might be related to how it's being sold in the retail space. We need to understand how the customer is going to interact in the call center and how the website help is going to provide assistance for them. Cross those gaps. Bridge those channels. So what we need to do is what I would call cross-pollinate, right? We need to be advocates of the process for a good user experience and a good experience, customer experience, a good service. We need to evangelize that internally. Work with our managers and teams. Show them the numbers. Show them what you did maybe on your project that wasn't maybe holistic in, in, in approach, but maybe just specifically related to what product or service you were working on and how you did this process and how it helped improve the overall success of that product. 
So we need to operate more like a hive, right? Like bees have their own kind of way of communicating with each other and passing information along. We need to operate like a hive because we need to understand the bigger vision. What is the end game here? What is the business goals? Where are we headed? We need to see kind of light at the end of the tunnel. You set a milepost out there so at least we're going in a direction. It might not be the right one. We might get halfway there and realize that that milepost, we need to pick it up and move it somewhere else. But at least we're going in that general direction. We could arc. We could curve our path to where we need to be going once we see that we're not quite on course. But until we put that stake in the ground, we have no idea where we're at. We're on a flat plain. We're in the middle of you know, Nevada desert, right? You know, and there's no particular wayfinding tool out there to navigate us through that. So we need to establish a vision. Where is it that we want, to, want this product or service to go? And that involves talking to the stakeholders and the business leaders and understanding what they think it should be. And then talking to the technologists and seeing what they see as the up and coming technology. You know, they're tapped into that. Talk to the marketing people. How do they think um, sales are gonna be like you know, down the road? How do they think we're gonna try to sell this? Is there a new metaphor that's coming around? Is software as a service gonna replace something that's more traditional? We need to look at all these kind of signals and pull them in and establish a vision, usually led from top down, but can also be led by the team entirely because it needs to be adopted as a hive. So we basically need to have a unified approach. We'd all be working together. A bike team isn't a bike team without the whole team working together. It's not just a whole bunch of riders riding together under the same flag. It's people that are actually supporting each other and even giving each other a leg up to move forward. So I want to move into some examples now. First one I want to talk about is Netflix. Near and dear to my heart. I kind of already mentioned it a little bit. Um, they've done some amazing cross-channel work. And it's not very noticeable. It doesn't stand out at you. It's not like, oh, yeah, of course. Of course, they, you know, I remember this thing that they did, and it just completely changed the way their business is operating. No, it's very subtle changes, very subtle integrations of different things. So right, I go to Netflix, I go to the website, I add something to my queue, right? Typical Netflix experience. Um, I'm going to add a DVD. I want to watch something, something dark side, right? Because who doesn't? Um, so I get a nice little email. It says, hey, this is when it's expected. OK, well, you know, a lot of web services do this, right? You, you do something, you interact with the system, it informs you via email um, what's going to happen next and you know, gives you some, sets some expectations with you. Um, but this is cross-channel, right? Because it's going from web to email. So our web systems and services need to be connected with the email. Then comes the actual DVD, comes in the mail and it's envelope, specifically designed. The packaging is very specifically designed to be reused. And this is something that's been processed through online systems. So it went from digital somewhere along the, the line. And there's that, again, line of visibility. So we didn't see behind the curtain. We didn't see somebody go to a shelf, pull a DVD out, put it in a mailer, put my address on it, and send it off or whatever. But that happens behind the scenes. Somehow it just happens, right? Black magic again. Um, after it arrives, I could tell them uh, when something went wrong. I could inform them. I could say, hey, you know, this thing came cracked in half, because it happens. And they go out of their way to solve that problem by cross-shipping, you know, shipping me something before I've sent this back. Um, there's a number of things that they do in service, and if anybody's used Netflix, they'll, they're probably familiar with them. So this is their traditional model, right? Their, their DVD by mail model. So. Um, when I send back a DVD after watching it, then I get another email, right? So again, going cross-channel. It's like, hey, we got it. Confirmed. That's great. I have now peace of mind that it didn't get lost in the mail, and I'm not going to have to pay a bazillion dollars or whatever it is for a late fee, which they don't really do. But um, you know, I know it made it there. Um, it also reminds me to go and update my queue to see what's going to be coming next and make sure that I kind of have a leg up on what I want to see next. But outside of the DVD experience, right, I could also stream online, right? So anybody recognize this movie? No? A few people? All right. Full Metal Jacket. So I could stream it on my, my uh, laptop if it's, if it's a, a movie that, you know, they have licensing to be able to stream. When I go to the website later on, it says I could resume it, right? 
and I resume from exactly where I left off. Here's the interesting thing. I could resume it from any app, pretty much. So if I go to a mobile device, you know, a tablet device, my TV has its own Netflix app on it. All that stuff, Xbox, I can go in there, go into my queue, see that movie, hit play, and it will recognize, oh, you already, you already saw this and you were halfway, watching, you know, halfway through watching it, would you like to resume? It will tell me that once I get to that screen on, on the Xbox at least. And so I, I can basically, it doesn't matter where I'm at, what context I'm in, it's cross-platform, right? It's all digital, it's all communicating with each other, you know? And guess what, you know, um, when I watch a movie streaming for the first time, it kind of follows up with me, says, hey, you watched this movie for the first time on that particular device, how did it go? How was your connection? Did you see any problems? Gives you a couple default options of what to pick. So if my experience went bad, guess what? I'm immediately compensated with an email saying, we know your experience went bad because we saw it happen. We control the servers, we could see what's going on, we could see the errors going out or whatever. We could see you constantly reloading the video or whatever. We're aware that something went wrong, even though you didn't tell us. And now we're gonna compensate you and give you something to kind of help sort of pay back that, that bad experience you had preemptively. Of course, I could also tell them when something went wrong, right? So that's a Netflix example, right? So web, email, product, packaging, um, streaming media, and mobile. Just cover all those channels in one simple resume functionality and DVD and reporting errors and stuff. So another example is REI. How many people know who REI is? There's a few people that don't. So they're Recreational Equipment Incorporated. They basically make the outdoors men's dream space. Um, everything from kayaks to bicycles, backpacks and tents, all that good stuff. Um, and all the products associated with it. Um, they, they sell and make their own as well. Um, so I had this experience where I wanted to get a mountain bike, right? I wanted to have a really nice mountain bike and I'm gonna go and I, I know REI and I, you know, they're local to the Seattle area and so I decided to, I would check out their website. So I did my research online, right? Browsing bikes and they have a pretty nice selection tool um, for me to be able to limit, you know, okay, my budget is here and what I'm looking for are these kind of features and it kind of narrows it down quite a bit. Um, not looking for the girl's bike, looking for the unisex and whatever, um, and a mountain bike, and it narrows it down, and I find a few options, and I pick one. And now I've done quite a bit of excessive research on just one website. Maybe I'll browse around a couple other websites, but the interesting thing here is, so where is the, where is the like, money-making button on this page? Does anybody want to call it out real quick? Add to cart, there are a lot of add to carts. If we look back at how many people research online and buy in retail, the money-making button is actually the find in store. So here I am doing this research. I'm buying a mountain bike. I'm not just going to add it to cart. I mean, I might. Maybe I know exactly what I want. Maybe my friend has that bike. I'm going to buy it right there. But mostly, I'm going to want to actually see the darn thing firsthand. So I want to go to the store. So I click the button, and I get this nice little experience here of telling me where it's in stock, and I don't have to think about it. The address is right there. I get map directions, and I'm done. Ah, great. It's at the flagship store in downtown Seattle. I'm going to go in there and check this bike out. So I head to the store, right? Go downtown Seattle, check out the retail store. They have this gigantic rock climbing wall thing. It's, it's an amazing experience if you haven't already gone. They have a ton of product. So even though I've narrowed down my selection down to like one bike, I go into the store and I might, you know, you know what, maybe this other bike might be actually a little bit better because it's very similar now that I'm seeing it firsthand. I could get on the bike and kind of try it out. Salesperson might come up and help me through this process, kind of guide me, give me some tips about what to look for, what's the right bike height for me. That's a huge thing that nobody seems to really quite understand that well, except for people who sell bikes, people who ride them on a regular basis. So all this stuff, you know, this kind of educational process occurs with me and the salesperson. Not only that, but guess what? 
I could actually try the bike right there at the store. They've built a bike track. And it's not just a little one. You can see up in the right-hand corner, it goes a, a good distance. I mean, it's not huge. It's not like I'm riding it around Green Lake or Brick Gilman Trail or something, but I get the good experience, right? I get to see how it's really going to handle, for the most part, out in, you know, when I'm at, where I'm actually going to take it, not just, you know, on pavement going down the street. This is a kind of a holistic experience that makes sense for that product. And they have that for a lot of things. If you go buy shoes there, they have like a little climbing area um, where you could test, uh, um, well, it's not a climbing area, it's a terrain sort of thing. And you could test hiking boots. And of course, they have the rock wall, so you could test climbing boots or climbing shoes. Um, so REI, we're, we're crossing web, retail, product, sales support, environment, all these things holistically thought about, about how the customer really thinks about the product. And there's like a hundred other things that they did too across channel, like messaging and text, so the description of the bike, the weight of it is consistent with what's on the physical product versus what's in, uh, displayed on the wall at the store near the bike and what's displayed um, on the, online and on the mobile app. All that messaging is consistent. So Comcast, another example. Company we love to hate, right? Comcast, ah, oh, my cable's down, why? No internet today, I can't tweet, right? It's interesting because that's like a lot of people's perspective of that company, a bad experience. They've had a bad experience somewhere. So there's a new show coming out on HBO. And I decided I wanted to get HBO so I could watch a specific show, um, Game of Thrones. And so I'm going to the HBO website and I'm like watching the trailer. I'm like, oh, yes, yes, totally. I totally have to get this. So I'm with Comcast, so I need to add HBO to my lineup. So I go to the website and I browse forever. I go and I sign into my account. I go on the public side of the, you know, kind of the space outside of my account uh, settings. I cannot, for the love of me, find out where I can add HBO. And it might be in there, in fact. It's just maybe not that well designed. So it was kind of a bad experience. I could add a package, a whole entire lineup of channels. I could subscribe to the package services where I'm adding internet, phone, TV, and you know, how to, you know, like a microwave and a toaster. Um, but I can't just add a channel. So I thought for a second, it's like, okay, well, what am I gonna do? Well, I clicked the chat. Clicked the chat was no help. Person didn't really tell me how to do it. They just told me to call a number. So they kind of didn't really think about that cross-channel experience. I'm on your website. Just provide that functionality for me right there. Don't tell me to go and use another channel because this one doesn't work for me. Make that transition smooth. So I, I, I gave up on the click to chat. And I heard a friend, I remember a friend saying something about how the Twitter experience is way better than the customer support over the phone. So I could talk to a customer support rep. I just happened to know one, Comcast Bill. Good old Bill. This guy rocks. He, he needs a raise. Um, so I decided I'd tweet to Bill and tell him, I'm just trying to add HBO. How in the heck do I do this on your website? Thinking that he was going to point me to something, like a, he'd give me a, a link, and I would ha have a page in front of me, and I would have HBO channel and it would say add, you know, add to cart, right? Or something like that, um, add to my lineup. What happened was, he's like, give me your account number. Did, gave it to him. Now, granted, I, I disappeared for maybe 10 minutes or something like that, um, so until I gave him my account number or whatever it was. Um, so there's a couple gaps here and we had some discussion and Twitter gave me a fail whale and so I didn't know if he got my DM crop that kind of out of this. But for the sake of simplicity, it was done in 14 minutes, and that was mostly my 14 minutes of time delaying getting back to him. I bet you this could have been done in like a minute or two. So he went in with my account, added it, told me he would let me know once it's been added. Then he tells me over Twitter, hey, it's been added, and man, it, it was like magic. It was, there was HBO. It was just done. So we're talking about somebody interfacing through digital experience, dealing with you know, social media that is able to access their systems on the back end to, to provide a better experience for me 
in digital TV. So streaming media or broadcast media. So web, click to chat, social media, and broadcast media, cross channel experience. Some of them a little rough on around the edges. Some of them they're working on fixing. Um, but for the most part, it was a pretty good experience. It changed my perspective of how I think about Comcast. You know, I still have problems once in a while. But they make a proactive effort. They call me up. Every once in a while, we're going to do a survey. Are you interested? Sure. Ask me a bunch of questions about my service. Not like the sales calls. Not like, well, how come you're not using our phone service, our digital phone service, voice over IP, whatever it is, right? No. It's about what my experience was like for my existing service. They're not trying to sell me anything new. They're trying to figure out what they're not doing right for their existing services. That's kind of a step forward. That's where we need to be going. We need to be proactive. We need to understand the experience. We need to know about the challenges that our customers and users face on a regular basis. So this is what I'm talking about when I say cross-channel experience. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I get a little impatient. I didn't want to get another good success story. Um, our experience is uh, we don't have a cross channel user manager. We don't have coordination. How do you break through the silos between the support, marketing, product development, and, and even sales to say, hey, everybody, we ought to watch out for this customer collectively? Is there some best way to have a success experience? Yeah, so ideally, right, you have a, you know, director of customer experience or something like that, right? REI has one. We they, get that. Yeah, but even they have challenges because that person sits in the retail cha channel. They don't have anything to do with, with e-commerce or the others, so they're having challenges too. And Samantha uh, Starmer, um, who works at REI, and, on the user experience team, um, how she deals with that is that she, she going back to that cross-pollination and breaking down the silos, what she does is she invites other people from other groups like marketing and sales and retail to see and experience what they're doing on the e-commerce side of things. So they get the exposure to this, right? They get to see like what's coming down the pipe, um, you know, what projects um, are yeah, at what stage in their process, um, what they've been thinking about, what they've been spending a lot of time on, what are the challenges they're running into. And they invite them all to these kind of, you know, brown bags, presentations. And then this interesting things started happening, this cross-pollination thing started happening. Brown bags started coming up for other groups. Retail wanted to get the user experience people into the retail space. They wanted to watch, they want the user experience people to come in and watch their training sessions for the retail people. They um, did an offsite for another group, and they brought those people, you know, from all these different divisions into that offsite, even though they weren't related to that particular group, because they wanted to have that conversation. They wanted to have that dialogue. They want to open those lines of communication. So that's really what it boils down to: is this need, uh, the, not this need, but feeding a need that maybe we didn't know was there until we started feeding and realized it was there of communicating across all these, you know, groups. You know, marketing people shouldn't be in their silo. Developers shouldn't be in their silo. We should all be working together. Designers should be talking to developers. User experience people should be talking to managers and retail people. Retail people should be talking to salespeople, marketing, and you know, across the board. It's, it should be a collective sort of experience. And it's with baby steps that it happens. So once you have that cross-pollination going, once that communication channel is open, it's interesting because then the, the leaders, the managers, the executives start to see this going on. Sometimes they start attending these sessions and they start to hear this conversation and see how retail is working with e-commerce to have that kind of handoff be smoother between those two experiences. And they start to understand and see the business value in it. And especially once things start getting implemented and rolled out within those groups in their own little projects, and seeing how that communication has helped smooth that process out and increased you know, um, sales and you know, the various numbers start ticking up. Um, 
And then they start getting invested. And then they start wanting to do more formalized structure behind it. I don't think there needs to be a cross-channel experience team. Because, there, like I said, there is not one way that one person could do this all. There's not even a way that one team could do this all. Because so when you think about it, it's like, OK, what would that cross-channel experience team look like? Well, it would be a packaging designer. It would be a print designer, a web designer. I mean, the list would go on and on just for design. Then you start moving into management and all these other things. It's impossible. There's no way to do that. You already have those teams built. They're just sitting in silos and not really talking to each other. And they're just building their part of it and not really thinking about the other part. What happens when there's a separate mobile team from the website team? What happens if that transition, if for some reason there needs to be a handoff between those two? You know, so that those, those ramps need to be built. And that is done through, simply through communication and doing things like customer journey mapping. When you customer journey map, you touch everything in the business. I mean, everything down to printed brochures to packaging and sales and how much you charge for something online versus in retail. I mean, like the whole bit. And it brings those discussions to light where there's challenges or where things might have been avoided because they were siloed and they didn't realize there were a problem um, because they don't see that transition point. I don't know if that answers your question, but I hope so. So I think every company needs to have a way to share information across the board, um, whether that's through an intranet, through a wiki, through a blog, team blog, whatever it might be. I think those things need to be put in place. And that's just even without doing cross-channel. So when you start thinking about cross-channel, then, OK, well, maybe there's a team blog over here for the developers and a team blog over here for the marketing people. And they kind of lock it down so only the marketing people get access it and only the developers can. Why not open that up? Why not allow everybody to see it? Make a universal portal so that everybody can kind of go into each other's areas and see what's going on uh, to some extent. I mean, obviously, there needs to be some level of security for certain information. But um, I think that just seems to be inherent with inside of a business. Um, you know, going from there, from, from that to like the community involvement, community involvement is quite an interesting thing. Um, you know, doing the user research is pretty important. And that involves the customer and the users. I don't know if that's what you're really talking about or not. But. Well, inviting their communication about the touch points without doing a special study where you go out. But they can, you know, communicate on some type of way or form on the thing, uh, on the very touch points. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of companies that are kind of being progressive about that. Um, and it really depends on your business model. Um, because, you know, maybe you don't want to, like, build a space where all your customers could just kind of rant and not provide constructive feedback. So it's really important to set up the tone and expectations of that space um, so that you get constructive information and you get um, those individuals working with you rather than complaining about it, right? Um, so there's ways to do that. You know, there, there's ways to get, get feedback from any kind of online you know, system, um, you know, but um, providing a space for them to collaboratively discuss with the team is, is pretty good progressive kind of nature of, of a business. Um, not, I don't think every business is ready for that. I think it's like a pretty big step, right? Because you, it's just, it's like, boom, transparency, right? Because you're like, okay, here's all these people complaining about this, you know, and the transparency factor is, okay, we should tell them it's fixed in this next version that we are about to release in two days. Well, maybe that's not a good idea to talk about a pre, uh, something before release. Maybe there's certain things that's inside the business that they can't talk about it until it's out. So how do you handle that? You know, and there's different ways to do it. Um, I actually had a good conversation with Kevin Chang over at uh, Twitter. And you know, I have the guy on Twitter, and uh, I feel bad because I would tweet him all the time, complaining about different problems. And he's like, gosh, I wish I could just tell him this is all fixed in the redesign. But he couldn't because it wasn't out. So um, there are some limitations about what you can be and can't be communicated through that process. So other questions? No other questions. I don't have any connects to give away, but you can get them in the lunchroom. All right, thank you, everybody.